I just so appreciate initially because it was such a short notice. You know, what if we just talk amongst ourselves and we can record? So let it be. But people joining us, it's our pleasure. Post election reflection, Colin, breaking the silence. And you are in for a treat today. The year 2020 has been flooded with emotions and actions. And I would like panelists, right after I name the year 2020, a year of disruption, exposure, violence, and inspiration and courage. So my way of coping with 2020 was a defiant hope. <laughs> I refused for my sanity to be in despair. I think that has carried me through. So that's where we are at. And one morning I woke up and I thought, during this lockdown, shelter in place, I so yearn for a space where we can talk together and reflect what happened on November 3rd. And a lot of drama even since then unfolded. So I just want to break the silence together with fellow Asian Americans, young and old. And today uh, we have three amazing people. And the reason why they are selected is because they walk the talk. There are many people who talk, but not necessarily walk their talk. So Reverend Dr. Andrew Lee is now, after 40 years of ministry, give him kudos and, you know, whatever way you can, you know, congratulate him. Anybody who can do the ministry for 40 years, kudos. He's been through a lot, thick and thin, and he's thrived. And now, Andrew, former Isaac's East Coast Project Director, is an Associate Director of uh, Billy Graham Santers at Wheaton College of Global Diaspora Institute. And he himself was a diaspora, came to, on a boat, not on the plane <laughs> from Hong Kong is what I heard. So um, he's written a lot of books and he is one of the prolific writer. So Andrew Lee, can you raise your hand? Yeah. And then Diane Uzie, she's a community, well-known community activist in Los Angeles. And uh, Diane has a rare combination of uh, activism with public policy gifts. And you can read all about her, but she wanted me to highlight that she's passionate about this API and Black Coalition Together, uh, they are working on reforming or changing criminal justice system in LA County. And Diane's passion just oozes out when she talks about the plight of the incarcerated people. So Diane, can you raise your hand? Thank you. And then Irene Cho, you would have never guessed that she's a graduate of Talbot Theological Seminary, MDiv. Sorry, I don't mean anything. <laughs> and now, after serving at Fuller's Youth Institute for 11 years, she wants to be her own boss in empowering young people. Her heart is with the youth. So your new uh, for-profit LLC is called In Between, right? And her husband is also a powerhouse. So Irene, if you don't know her, Irene, can you raise your hand? 
she moved from LA to Oakland. So stay tuned. She's dreaming a lot of innovative stuff. So we'll keep our eyes on her. And I just noticed that uh, Brianna Val Vanden from North Carolina, yes, from Duke, our uh, Isaac board secretary. Hi, Brianna. Over there, yeah. So Duke rocks. And we have Howard Kim, who is Isaac's new director of communication. Howard, yay. And then where is DJ? DJ is navigating this technology. Orange man from Orange <laughs> and tech savvy. So he's my go-to person when it comes to tech problem. And then, hey, Miriam. Miriam Cho from Durham, North Carolina. She's gonna deal with Facebook Live. So thank you all. This is very intergenerational. And um, I think I may have to introduce Russell Moy. I think he's on. He is a co-founder of Isaac, joining from Oakland. All right, without further ado, I would like our panelists to briefly describe year 2020, your emotion and actions. Andrew, this is very feminine space. So we don't separate thoughts and feelings and values. It's a holistic space. So name your feelings about election, post-election dramas, and you name it. Okay, you want me to start? Yeah. Okay. I was approached in August to contribute an article to, be, to a book to be written by Evangelico stating why they would not vote for Trump in this year's elections. And since I had retired from my church at the end of June, I felt I had complete freedom to write my opposition to the president. I no longer had any legal ties to the church, so I wrote from the perspective of being a Chinese American with application for Asian Americans in general. Trump's Make America Great Again slogan, I interpreted as coded language for Make America White Again, as immigrants and people of color are not the equal of white mm -hmm. people. And we've seen how this has played out in his policies against DACA, the drastic reduction of immigrants allowed into our country, and his refusal to denounce white supremacists, to name a few examples. And I knew there would be opposition to my position against a second Trump term from friends and members, and maybe even from some who are present this evening, but I believed I needed to do it despite their disapproval. And I understand why some Christians prefer Trump over Biden because some of the president's policies align with their beliefs. I don't disagree with all the president's decisions, but I personally had concluded that overall, when you look at the total picture, this was not a man that should remain our president based on his words and actions over these past four years. Both his rhetoric and his policies have hurt too many people and divided our country. This book was uh, I, that I contributed to was published on October 1st. So my thoughts are out there in print for everyone to read. And in a manner of speaking, would my viewpoint be supported and vindicated by the election results or not? So I had a vested interest in the outcome. As you know, the vote tally was inconclusive for days as the mail-in ballots were counted. And my wife and I never paid so much attention to CNN and other news channels as we waited for the latest results, perhaps, uh, you, you were also following very closely. When Biden was finally declared the winner by most news outlets on Saturday, November 7th, we were elated that we would have a new president. We were overjoyed and as it turned out, we were not the only ones. Mm -hmm. As we watched media coverage of the spontaneous and exuberant celebrations around our country throughout the day and night as this news spread, this is what I told my wife. I said, this reaction is what you see when dictators are overthrown in foreign countries. The citizens of the country rejoice because the shadow of oppression has been lifted. If there were a statue of Trump standing somewhere, it would be torn down, I said to her. Mm -hmm. I've never seen anything like this before in America, and I've at least been somewhat aware of all the presidential elections since John Kennedy. I believe that Trump's actions post-election corroborate my opinion of him. 
Mm -hmm. He continues to make groundless claims that the election was rigged and stolen from him. He incites his followers to stop the steal, whereas he and his allies are actually the ones who are trying to steal and overturn legitimate election results. The Electoral College will finally meet this coming Monday to cast their ballots. Whether this action will finally put the election results at a conclusive end and Trump concedes remains to be seen. And my guess is that he won't and he'll keep fighting and spewing his false rhetoric to egg on his supporters. So personally, I'm still a bit emotionally on edge, even though the handwriting is on the wall that we will have a new president on January 20th. And it's difficult for us to completely move forward as a country until this matter has been put to rest. I'm personally disappointed that more Republican leaders lack the courage to speak up publicly for what is right and to do what is right. The latest lawsuit that was brought by the Texas Attorney General attempting to invalidate the votes of four states is baseless, an opinion shared by the Supreme Court in its ruling yesterday. The rejected suit was joined by the attorneys general in 17 states and supported by at least 126 Republican members of Congress. And according to one editorial board, quote, it is particularly astonishing that 17 of the House signatories were elected by voters in the states whose election results Texas was seeking to invalidate. They signed a letter directly challenging the legitimacy of their own victories and the integrity of their own state's elections, end quote. Mm -hmm. Why did they do such a thing? Because they're afraid to upset Trump. So post-election, we will need to continue to deal with the former president who has the ears of tens of millions of Americans. We live in a divided nation with a broken political system that badly needs to be reformed. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Andrew, and thank you for your rare moment of passion showing in your <laughs> speaking. <laughs> I can sense your anger and frustration. What's alarming is lawmakers signed up to invalidate voters who voted. So we are in for a tough ride regardless of election outcome. So I turn to Irene Cho now, who is joining us from Oakland. What emotions and actions have you taken? Um, I think, you know, I, I had done some reflection right before the night before the election, um, feeling this heavy weight of what was about to happen. And I felt really different this year. Um, you know, 2016, I think I still had this perception of what America and what Americans would do that would be the right path. Um, and I, I was suspicious that Trump would win, um, but I, I didn't actually think it would happen. I still was in the camp of surely, you know, people will in majority make the right decision. Um, and so for me, 2016 was I keep continually saying it, 2016 was my lemonade album. It was the final thing for me to really begin to dive in and see America for what so many of our black sisters and brothers have been telling us it is, you know, all these things that I think it, it was the straw that broke the camel's back for me. Um, and so for 2020, I pretty much went in thinking Trump is gonna win. Um, for the last four years, all we've seen is an increase in their rhetoric, you know, an increase in what was happening. And, and I held on to hope. So for me, it was reality and hope kind of intersecting together. Um, and, you know, I saw so much hope. There was change, you know, all the things that were happening with moderate folks, moderate Christians and evangelicals that I knew. Um, their shift and their also beginning of their journey to see what was happening, you know, the protest revealed so much, um, all the all the dialogue that was happening seemed to indicate some hopefulness of possible change. Um, and yet, I think for me, 2016 was just too much of a kick in the gut to not embrace that this is probably going to be another four years. Um, 
So I'm delighted at this point <laughs> because, you know, whatever small margin it was, I mean, I, I think the Thursday when um, they began to finalize the count for Georgia and they started calling it, I, I really didn't watch a lot of the news. Um, I didn't watch a lot of the news on election night because I knew it was going to be, you know, a long time. I went to sleep early at like 11 um, and then it just dragged on. And my husband woke me up Thursday morning and he said they called it. And I said, oh, my God, they called it. And they said, he's like, yes, they're, they're calling it for Biden. And I just burst into tears. Um, this this wave of relief and uh, this belief that it actually was possible that we, we were able to change the tide. All of the rage that I had posted over the last four years, <laughs> like conversations I've had with just dozens and hundreds of people, you know, in regards to this fight and arguments that I've had on, online because my friends have invited me to, you know, conservative groups and mixed groups where we've just had to flesh it out and have had back and forth. Um, you know, it, it felt like, I just felt hopeful that the mm -hmm. work we're doing is not um, in vain. And so there was that, but also, you know, I had made this post of why going into the election, I was, I wasn't going with this massively heavy heart and more prepared um, thinking that Trump would win. Because if 2020 has shown us anything, I think it was a year that really revealed the final, you know, loincloth being removed on the United States that we have a massive problem. Um, we, the white supremacy that you know, we are talking about is not something in deep, dark corners, but is in 40, what, what are we at? 48% of the citizens who voted for Trump. You know, we cannot ignore the people who are out on the streets in DC right now, as we are having this panel, you know, discussion that are protesting for their rights, that Trump is still the, the correct, you know, choice and winner of this election. And so, you know, I think I, I went into 2020 election knowing that whatever the results were, if Biden and Harris wins, whew, at least, you know, we have somewhat of a bit of favor on our side, you know, with policies and all these things moving forward. And yet the work on the ground to really continually push forward change, um, it's, we're just beginning, you know, because so many evangelicals have just this year the light bulb started turning off. You know, I always talk in youth ministry, that moment when you're with middle schoolers where the light bulb goes off and they start connecting the dots, it's, it's the aha glorious moment in youth ministry. And I feel like so many of us that have had conversations with white folks and conservatives and evangelicals and moderates in particular, the light bulb has finally gone off in 2020. Um, and so that makes me hopeful and yet um, I think I'm going into all of this knowing the work, we have so much more work to do because yes. mm -hmm. so many people are just beginning their journey into this. Yes, we have a lot more work we need to do together. So um, thank you for that hopeful note. And Diane, what were you feeling and what actions have you taken in 2020? So just by, hey, everybody. Hello, everybody. Aloha. Aloha. Yeah, so I'm old. So the first campaign I worked on was for Reverend Jesse Jackson in 1984 and then in 88. So just kind of that will give you a sense of, um, you know, where I'm coming from. I've lived through all kinds of elections, all different eras, all kinds of reforms. But before, before I share a few thoughts, and by the way, I don't think in a linear way. So I'm gonna share a prayer poem rather than, than speak um, straight. But um, if, if you may name your emotions, I think it's important. Yeah, I will, I'm going to. Mm -hmm. But before we do, could I invite us all to just take a deep breath, breath together so that we can just um, be centered, be connected, and reflect on Imago Dei. So just let's just pause for a moment and let's take a deep breath in. And acknowledge we are on stolen land. 
an Imago Dei. So the prevailing emotion for me post-election and throughout the election has been achy hope. Very, very <laughs> achy. Um, but I'm always hopeful because, you know, we're with the people. And I believe Christ would be with us in these moments. So um, while, so let me, let me just first say thank you to Young and to Harold and to Miriam and to DJ for pulling this together. And a grateful nod to each one of you tonight for making time and much respect to Andrew and Irene. So candidly, y'all, like the way we respond now is how I believe we should be responding all day, every day. And it's how I yearned for the church to respond when I was coming up in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. So at the age of 17, I witnessed my non-Christian activist mentors embody love and justice, and it's why I left institutionalized church and rel religiosity. And so some of the public rhetoric from two 2016 all the way through now reinforced why I had to leave institutionalized church and religiosity. But ironically, it's also why I went to Fuller Theological Seminary after 25 years of frontline work to get my MDiv. And I believe in my bone marrow that our history of oppression and privilege must be prayerfully and boldly and actively pursued. So the prayer poem that I'm going to share poses a few questions for all of us to consider, myself included. Because again, I, I, don't, I process through a lot of um, spoken word, through prayer, through music, and through physicality. And I ask myself these questions all day, every day. So the name of this prayer, and don't worry, it won't exceed two minutes. The name of this prayer is That Was Then, This Is Now. And it's dedicated to frontline activists who have offered their bodies as a living sacrifice. Mm -hmm. So here's a prayer about then and now, some of the why, some of the how. On a sweltering evening, 1965, Avalon Boulevard at 705, Ronald and Marquette just minutes from home, who will die? Who will roam? LAPD and the CHP, no American dream, as Marquette's mama cries, wails, and screams. That was then, this is now. West Side Buddha heads, that's what Asians were called, had no beef, from coloreds to blacks, one tree, many leaves. Crenshaw and Jefferson, most stores unharmed, as sirens sounded doom and alarm. See, Blacks and Asians protected these shops as gunfire spewed on civilians by cops. 35 people died that night. The Watts Rebellion, a lifelong fight. Flames ensued, flesh and blood spewed. Yellow is brown, brown is black. Now that you see, there's no turning back. Thousands of names, too many each day. And right here in LA, black bodies gunned down every city, every town. Do you ever question the mugshot on screen? It's used to manipulate, degrade, and demean. And where is church amid all of this? Mm -hmm. I've seen too many deny and dismiss. 91, 92, Rodney King, soon Jadu. Let's name Latasha, let's confront that pain. We have a lot to lose, much more to gain. Where'd you learn that, we must ask? Dismantling racism, a deep purging task. Frontline activists have given their lives for benefits we reap, wrapped in middle-class lies. And where is church, the API church, for us that are light-skinned, straight-haired, good zip code ensnared? Will we stand with our people, our black and brown people, or pray to white God, American church, American steeple? There's nothing in scripture, as far as I can tell, allowing police to make living hell. So API church, where do we stand? With blue-eyed Jesus on stolen land? or with dark brown Christ, our one true Lord. There's a train a coming, let's climb aboard. When you are tempted to live into privilege, name that sin up, come back to this village. Siblings, brothers and sisters, behold and be bold. May Christ's brown skin be named and extolled. There's fire in the sky, smoke in our eyes, but look around now. See our community, it is true divine love justice and unity, then and now, then and now. Ashe, 
and our share. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think it segues beautifully as I can sum up that poem as poetic justice. Andrew, with PhD in religion from Baylor University, I don't think we can do Christianity as we have done. And I think this naked public square is filled with frauds and lies and propaganda. So in this fractured nation, a nation that is mourning, as you have done your ministry for 40 years, what do you think God is calling Asian American to do? And what is our social responsibility as a Christian with Asian face? On mute? <laughs> Can't hear. We're gonna go out of order. You want me to go first? Yeah, I want it because it segues to you. Okay. okay. Uh, so what's God calling us as Asian American Christians to do, right? What's our social responsibility? It so happened that I was invited to guest preach at my church's uh, virtual service on November 8th, the day after, uh, the Sunday after the elections, and knowing that there would be people on both sides of the political aisle, some pro-Trump, some pro-Biden, I chose to address the issue of what we are to do post-election, regardless of who won. And I made sure that I recorded the message on Monday, November 2nd, the day before the elections, so that I couldn't be accused of any bias in my message. My three points post-election were one, the purpose of government remains the same, two, the purpose of Christians remains the same, and three, the purpose of the church remains the same regardless of who won. There is a social responsibility component in each of these three areas. In 1 Timothy 2.2, it states that we are to pray for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. If a central purpose of government is to help its citizens lead peaceful and tranquil lives, godly and dignified, then shouldn't that also be the purpose of its citizens as well? Christians should be model citizens, so we have a social responsibility under normal circumstances to be obedient to the government, even to be formally involved in politics, if that is our interest, with the intention of shaping government policies for the welfare of society and to participate in civic engagement to support what is good. Regarding formal political involvement, there was an op-ed this past Thursday in the New York Times from Tim Wu, a law professor at Columbia University. His essay is entitled, What Really Saved the Republic from Trump? His conclusion is that it wasn't our constitutional system of checks and balances that saved us from Trump undermining democracy. Rather, it was the virtue of those holding public office. It is because judges and other officials in government positions would not yield to Trump's demands to overturn the elections, even if they had been appointed by Trump in the first place. We would be in an extremely precarious situation right now in America if we had allowed this self-coup to take place for the leader of our country to remain in office even after he had been voted out. The character of public officials is a major factor that prevented this, even if they had been threatened with physical violence and had their reputation smeared as has happened in Georgia. Most Asian Americans have not taken part in the formal political process with a few exceptions. Our vice president elect Kamala Harris is part South Asian. Andrew Yang, one of the early democratic presidential hopefuls is Chinese. And now the rumor is that he will run for mayor of New York City. As Asian Americans continue to climb the societal ladder, why not also consider becoming involved with local politics if that is how God leads you? Moving now from formal to an, infor to an example of informal civic engagement. This past June in Chicago, we held a march for black lives and dignity in the wake of the killings of black men and women. We had about a thousand people come out, mostly Asian Americans. Uh, and actually some of, uh, at least one person present tonight was there, two. 
My church was heavily involved with the logistics before the march and on the ground that day making the march possible. The state representative for our district is Chinese and she was blasted by many in the Chinese community for supporting the march. When we first started thinking about having a march, I had asked some of my 20 something year old leaders what they thought about it, expecting that they would be excited about it. Instead, they had measured responses because of all the anti-March chatter being circulated on WeChat. Despite the checkered history between Blacks and the Asian American community in Chicago, it was the right thing to do, to speak out for racial justice and to support another minority community. So we proceeded. Some young families even came with their children and toddlers to show their support. The March is only one example of social activism. We've been involved with food distribution in the Chinatown community beginning in the spring and finally ending with winter upon us. We partnered with secular organizations to make this possible. Some of our church leaders organized cleanup teams when Chinatown and nearby neighborhoods were looted during the summer demonstrations. They've also helped distribute needed food and materials to communities that are not Chinese and are heavily black. Helping out at food kitchens was something that some of our fellowships were already doing prior to the pandemic. A typical Asian attitude is to take care of our own. We need to go beyond that. The pandemic is pressuring churches to come out of their business as usual, mind my own business silos, to consider how they can be relevant and of help to communities which are in need. Moving it along. Um, thank you so much, Andrew, for sharing all of that. Um, I 100% agree and echo on um, all of it. Uh, you know, I think, I think for me, A, I, as you were talking about the WeChat thing, I just found out um, there was this one gal on TikTok. She was sharing how uh, conservative Chinese um, were utilizing WeChat to provide misinformation. Um, and there was there's this whole movement with young people on TikTok to try and bring about re-education um, <clears throat> on WeChat to dispel and provide real information, factual information, et cetera. So there's this whole other world. I've been unpacking a lot of that with my Chinese American friends. Um, here, you know, in the States. And one of them, she had served in Taiwan for a few years. So thank you for just pointing that out. And, and I think, you know, obviously we always talk about Asian Americans, you know, not being a monolith and there's so many complexities and layers to, to all the different, you know, subgroups we have within, you know, our, our big gigantic group umbrella called Asian American. Um, and I think for me, my context is predominantly Korean immigrant church context. Um, and I, I struggle. I'm going to be straight up vulnerable and honest um, and transparent about the fact that I really still struggle with the, the dialogue um, and the mindset and the theology and the ecclesiology that exists um, in Korean churches in particular, um, Korean American churches and Korean churches. Um, so I haven't really been involved for a long time, you know, in those contexts because of the fact that just as Diane's poem that she read, you know, I, it's still so entrapped with white Jesus. And I, the conservatism and the patriarchal um, misogyny, I'm just going to straight up say it, that exists, you know, in that world still, it's, I think, you know, for me, it, it's so exhausting. Um, and I don't, I don't, I struggle with still having hope that there can be work done um, when the leaders of those communities have been so unwilling um, to even begin to try and have conversations to unpack their own contributions into white supremacy and their own contributions into um, perpetuating this toxic masculine patriarchy that has been perpetuated, you know, all throughout church's history. Um, so I don't have a solution um, in regards to that, but kind of just wanting to name the reality of, of 
what I struggle with. Um, and, you know, I think the last, again, in my journey over the last five years, I, I've shared with a friend, she's a, a leader, she was also a leader at Fuller. Um, and we were both talking about being a woman in leadership. And, and she said her whole life, she had really been unpacking and, and figuring out what it meant as being a leader as a black person. And that coming to Fuller really began her journey to unpack what it what that identity looked like as a leader, as a woman, um, and the intersectionality of, of that. And I, I said, you know, what's really interesting is my personal journey has been the opposite because of the fact that I predominantly, my ministry career has been in Korean immigrant church spaces. My ethnic identity has had never really been one on the table that I needed to struggle with. And if anything, for me, you know, growing up um, in a time period where, you know, I I wasn't surrounded a lot or in a geographical location, especially where I wasn't around a lot of Asian Americans, um, white spaces were safe for me because as a woman leader, as a woman pastor who so very rarely was acknowledged to be of value, to be worthy to come to the table to contribute, even though I cleaned up all their crap, you know, cleaning up and editing curricula and, you know, preaching better than them, et cetera, all these things you know, going to white spaces was so, for me, um, refreshing and, and life-giving because they would acknowledge my validity um, to come to the table and, and invite me. And so when I began to really dive into my journey of intersecting then my ethnicity and my Asian Americanness and what does that all mean and and coming into the truthfulness of the limitations of whiteness and white supremacy in the church, in the American church, in the American evangelical church in particular, um, I've really struggled with with understanding how to converge, you know, those two those two identities together, um, and and what does that all mean to create this third space that I'm really looking hopeful to and looking forward to that I feel that a lot of us are trying to create as we're dismantling all the various different, you know, elements that have kind of bound us into this limited space or limited box. Um, so that's where I'm at um, mm -hmm. in regards to, you know, where I think God is wanting us to go as Asian Americans. I still, I feel even for myself, that we have so much journeying to do. We have so much to unpack, so much to learn, so much to really dig in deeper. Um, and for all of the, you know, we're, we're newer to this conversation, you know, we, especially for Koreans, you know, um, that, that we have a lot, where I feel behind, I personally feel behind, which keeps me humble and keeps me really wanting to listen and learn um, and read from others. And so, you know, I just, I think, want to challenge all who is watching and listening and on a daily basis as, as Asian Americans, what are you unpacking today that you didn't, that you were still unwilling to unpack yesterday um, and, and moving forward you know, how are we able to ask these hard questions of ourselves, you know, in, in all of that without losing our identity, without losing our value and our worth. So, yeah. Thank you, Irene. Is my mic working? <laughs> okay. So, Diane, uh, I think what Irene shared, uh, you can answer because I believe that Crancha Street was Japanese American town before it became black, you know, majority. So there's a lot that we uh, latecomers can learn from Chinese and, you know, Japanese American history as well. So what do you think God is calling Asian American post Trump era and moving forward? Yeah, so I think we have to pay, I don't know, give a nod and honor and respect our OG activists who have um, 
come before us. They've been vocal. They've been pioneers. Everything that we have, everything mm. that we're able to do, that we're blessed with, literally is on the backs of brothers and sisters who gave their lives. Many were not Christian. So I think we are called to, uh, to take some lessons learned. Hey, y'all, by show of emoji, how many of you had the privilege and blessing of taking Asian American studies at any point in your life? Just show like a thumb or some kind of an emoji. Asian American studies. Yeah, and sadly, you know what? It should be part of K through 12. It shouldn't be some sort of an elective that you take in college. It should be infused. But since it's not, um, I would love to give a lot by way of PowerPoint. I just have a few images. Um, in my upbringing, most of my people were, were, were revolutionaries. They were NOI, Nation of Islam. They were Muslim. They were, they were Buddhist. They were agnostic. Or they were very progressive Christians. Um, and so um, we rarely saw uh, mainstream Christians on the front lines. So let's just show a few images because while the, a lot of American evangelicals have been silent in the, in the, in the language of, in, of justice, um, we're reaping the benefits of those who mm -hmm. were very vocal. So can we show that PowerPoint really quick, please? It's really fast. DJ, Miriam. Mm -hmm. Can we go to the first slide? Yeah, so you know, Yuji Ichioka and all of these amazing activists were helpful in making sure we were no longer Orientals and we were Asian American. Thanks, because now we have Asian American and ethnic studies. And we've had a very long history of resistance and power. And I wanna just lift that up and make sure that we can really embrace that. Next slide, please. Yeah, check that out. Look at the next slide and, and could I get a volunteer to read that really quick? Hey, how come it's like that? It should be a full paragraph. That's weird. You might, you might have to shrink the font size. It fit before. So from early as the 1800s, We've, were, we've been protesting and Chinese were protesting the Gary Act. It's cool, we can skip. We're gonna go through this really fast. But just know that from the 1800s, we've been vocal. And then as you can, and this is not in Kron order, Larry Itliong, right alongside Dolores Huerta, Cesar Chavez, the very food that you're eating and the labor laws and for farm workers and migrant workers was the direct result of Filipino, Filipino farm workers. Next slide. Really fast, really fast. Oh man, why are my slides like this? Shoot, I don't even know what that was. I think I was talking about Japanese and Mexican farm workers. We could go to the next slide. Hey, so during World War II, Executive Order 9066, over 18,000 Japanese Americans resisted. You know, the narrative is that we all went quietly and we were super compliant. No, man, there was a whole camp called Tule Lake just for resistors and there were over 18,000. Next slide, please. You can go to the next slide. Yeah, so Yuri Kochiyama was part of Nation of Islam. She lived in Harlem. She raised her family there. She became super close friends with Malcolm. Yuri's children are friends of mine. We used to train Kung Fu in, in the stinky gym in, uh, in New Chinatown, LA. That's why it's super personal to me because activists, not only would we do the hard work, but we would have to train our bodies because we knew that it was a very physical at, um, part of, of our lives. Next slide, please. So y'all, look at these women. Look at them. They're, 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 they're not passive. They are, they are standing up against the, wrongly, the wrong conviction of Cho So Lee, who was wrongly convicted of murder in, in San Francisco, Chinatown. It's a long, long, long story, but I had the privilege of, of being uh, Cho So Lee's counselor when I worked in a drug program when he was finally released. And sadly, um, he did die an untimely death. But, you know, know that Cho So Lee helped to, to sort of make sure that Pan-Asians, all kinds of different Asians came around 
uh, to, to support his release. Sadly, we didn't have an infrastructure to deal with him when he got out. So he started freebasing cocaine, but that's why he ended up in the drug program where I work. Next slide. Yeah, homie right there, Warren Fudutani, one of our first elected officials in LA for school district and an assembly, but he started with the third world liberation movement. And next slide. So the storefront that I talked about in my poem, in Crenshaw, actually the story, the, the, the history is that African-Americans um, really welcomed Japanese Americans after World War II because we couldn't live in a lot of neighborhoods. There was redlining. And so Buddha, Japanese Americans and black folks lived harmoniously in the Crenshaw district and opened up a storefront um, where they did tutoring, they did teach-ins. And a lot of what mobilized us was anti-war, anti-Vietnam war. So my ex, was part of the founding of, of Asian Americans against the Vietnam War. Um, anyways, that's a whole nother story. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Real fast, next slide, please. So if you ever get a chance, click on UCLA Asian American Studies Ghidra. And if you want just reams and reams and reams of essays and articles and reports and art and poetry and spoken word and images that will that will inspire and fire oh my lord check out Ghidra these are the frontline activists that help to form ethnic studies as we know it today next slide so as as some of you all have already talked about Andrew and Irene and Young one of the questions or some of the questions I often ask people that I'm I'm dealing with mostly incarcerated as we start to unpack stuff as we start to unpack untruths that we've internalized, when we start to get new information, one of the re reflection questions I ask is, what do you think? How do you feel? And what will you do? And so I'm hoping you'll take those three questions post, post Zoom. What do you think? How do you feel? What will you do? And then finally, um, last slide, Romans 12, we belong to each other. And so another guiding question could be, what are some of the local state or federal policies or budget issues that you can support, monitor and be engaged in? I'm happy to share with you after or talk with you after. Um, one example is at, in Inglewood, California, uh, the United Methodist Church that I'm um, active with, but not a member of, is we're going to physically block um, some housing evictions by corporate land, literally physically block it with our bodies as corporate landlords start to uh, deploy evictions. Inglewood also from the pulpit and after church would train its congregations how to register people to vote and how to phone bank. And then um, a statewide group in, in California is API Rise and we're part of a coalition fighting the transfers of our brothers and sisters who have already served time in jail and prison were fighting their transfer into ICE detention because they've, they've already paid their dues. They've already served their time. Even though they're undocumented, we're also working on um, getting governor, the governor to pardon them so that they can stay here since many of them came here at the age of four, at the age of nine, usually on a boat and usually fleeing a country that we bombed it out of. So, you know, um, candidly, uh, it's, it's, it's horrific that we treat people that we've so-called gone to their defense. And when they get here, we treat them like second-class citizens. So right now, this group called the Vision Group is considering either legislation or an executive order. And then do I have any more slides? No. So Diane, uh, some people <coughs> chat ask if these slides can be posted on Isaac website. Yeah, if you $5. I'm kidding. <laughs> so, all right. Money speaks all the time. But I just want to thank you so much. So if you want us to tackle this um, colonized theology and privatized theology, we can round up some theologian who is not just cerebral, but theologian who gets hands and foot dirty or wet. So we believe in no separation of theology, just talk, but walk. Theologians who walk the talk. So that's what we will do if you are open for us to create that space. So on my last comment, Irene, 
I fought for democracy. I was sprayed with tear gas in Seoul. Tank occupied my campus, Yonsei, and we sang protest songs. I never imagined in my entire life that I have to fight for democracy in America. So no separation of faith and our public action. And that vacuum led me to study theology. So folks, I just so appreciate all of your young folks' face. We, it's an American phenomenon that you cannot talk politics and money and sex. Guess what? We have all those three problems. Nowhere else, even in Europe. I just landed in Zurich and all these physicists were asking about, are you guys gonna really vote for Bush? And we spoke in broken English about politics. I just met them. Only in America, you cannot talk about politics. That's why we remain siloed and tribalized. And so we are committed to creating a space where you as a Christian can freely talk politics and policies that impact our lives as Asian American and minority. And don't just take white knowledge as it is. Decipher, dissect, and bring our stories and our histories and our knowledge and write. So our journal is open to young people too. You can write your own narratives. So we have all this infrastructure we built. Join us and check us out. So help us to get to know you and we have newsletter. You can just check us out on the website and Facebook. And on Facebook, Miriam, we need more likes, right? I don't believe in numerical numbers, but still having constituencies help. So can I just offer blessings? And then if you want us to create number two, can you give me thumbs up? And unpack what we know as we know and challenge that and peel off all the onion layer upon layers, we will do so. So we are here to serve you. And younger generation, you don't need to build your infrastructure. It's been built. You can walk on the bridge. Why try to build bridge? Amen. So may God kindle your heart and stretch your mind, stretch your arms, and let you walk in the light and be prepared to bring change. With no change, there's no life. We change every day. With change, God gives us life-giving energy. God's breath, Ruah, breathes in us, through us, and to our country, the nation that is in mourning nation that has lost so many lives and with no ritual to collectively even grieve. It's like a God shuts out our prayer. When we need sanctuary the most, we don't even have access to gather as a body of Christ. But may God help you. May God touch your heart and mend your broken heart and may God bless us so that we can meet together and hug again and be the body of Christ again. Thanks be to God for you showing up. That encourages us and keeps us going. So thank you. Thank you for participating. And let's give a big hands to our panelists. <laughs>